Hello everyone. Today we are diving into the fascinating world of eco eco plants. Throughout this presentation, we will simplify the complexity surrounding eco plants, providing you with a clear understanding of its significant cultivation and impact on various industries. So let's embark on this journey together. We will explore the wonders of micro plants. Micro plants are plants that are grown by humans for food and other resources. We have maize, sorghum, rice, and wheat. Maize grown in a tropical and temperate climates be able but able to grow well in high temperature. Varieties have also been bred and grow in cooler climates. And sorghum able to grow in hotter, drier conditions than other cereal crops. Rice mostly grown in tropical and subtropical climates as it generally requires temperature at least 20 Celsius. Rice adapted to grow in wet condition. And finally, we have wheat. Wheat grown in a temperance climate and able to survive temperature below freezing. Let's look into the flower and fruit structure. This is wheat pollination. Wheat pollination for cereal crops like maize, corn, happen when the wind carries pollen from the male flowers to the female flowers of the plant. Maize flowers is referring to these are located at the top of the maize plant and they release pollen into the air. Meanwhile, female flowers are found at the bottom of the plant and each seed connects to an ovary where a canal will develop it fertilize. And wind is actually, when it blows, it carries the pollen from the tassels to the silk. Pollination, some of the pollen land on the sticky silks where it's traveled down to the ovary, fertilizing it. And after fertilization, the ovary develops into a canal, which eventually becomes a corn grain. And we play a crucial role in the pollination process because for mice plants, by transporting pollen from the male flowers to the female flowers, which is lead to the productions of canal. Let's look into the self-pollination and the cross-pollination. They have a differences between these two. And self-pollination is actually, you just imagine a flower that can pollinate itself without needing help from other flowers or external factors. And during this process, pollen from the male part of a flower land on the female parts of the same flower or another flower on the same plant. So some plants like pea and tomatoes have flowers that can self-pollinate because their male and female parts are close together. Meanwhile, cross-pollination, let's imagine a flower that needs a little matchmaking help from other flowers to reproduce. And during this process, pollen from the male part of one flower is transferred to the female part of another flowers on a different plant of the same species. Example, bees buzzing from flower to flower, carrying pollen between them is a classic example of cross-pollination. And this happens in many plants like apples and cherry, where the flowers are designed to attract pollinators. So, as a conclusion, in the essence, self-pollination is like a plant taking care of its own business, while cross-pollination is like a plant getting a little help from its friends or insect to spread its genetic material to other plants. Let's look the steps how the fruit formation after pollination and fertilization. There are several steps. First, what happened? Look what happened during pollination and fertilization. 
after pollen lands on the stigma of a flower and fertilize the ovule, a zygote form. And this zygote is the beginning of a new plant. Then we have seed development. During seed development, the fertilized ovule begins to grow into a seed. It is like a tiny plant embryo inside the ovary of the flowers. And the next step, you can see the ovary grow. As the seed develops, the ovary of the flower start to grow and change, and it becomes what we know as the fruit. And then, after ovary grows and it becomes fruit, then we call it as a fruit formation. The ovary now transform into a fruit, surround and protect the development seed, and it can grow into various shapes, sizes, and texture depending on the plant species. And then, the next step, we have seed dispersal. Once the fruit is mature, it's ready to spread its seeds. This can happen in many ways, like animals eating the fruit, dispersing the seeds through their droppings, or the fruit falling to the ground, and seed being carried away by the wind or water. Now let's look into the process of photosynthesis in maize and sorghum. Maize and sorghum are C4 plants, meaning that they have a special way of photosynthesizing which can help them thrive in hot and sunny environment. And in this condition, a common enzyme called Rubisco can get confused and start using oxygen instead of carbon dioxide, which is slowing down the process of photosynthesis. And this process is called photorespiration. And to avoid this, C4 plants like maize and sorghum have developed a clever trick. They separate the carbon fixing process from where Rubisco operates. And then how does it work? First, in special cells called mesophyll cells, carbon dioxide combine with a module called PET to form a four carbon compound. And this four carbon compound move into another set of cells called bundle sheet cells. And inside the bundle sheet cells, the four carbon compound break down which release the carbon dioxide. Rubisco safely tuck away in the bundle sheet cell, then get to work, catalyzing the reaction of carbon dioxide with another molecule called RUBP. And the Kelvin cycle, the part of photosynthesis that makes sugar then proceed as usual, but inside these bundle sheet cells. And Actually, one cool thing about this plant is that the enzyme they use for photosynthesis can work at higher temperature than those in other plants, making them well suited for hot climates. Let's look into what are the features available in order for sorghum adapt for growth in dry conditions. First, they have small leaf area and how it helps the plant to survive in dry condition is by reduced water loss through transpiration because as less surface area is available for evaporation. Next, on top of that, it has vex covered leaf and internode, which impermeable wet layer reduces water loss from the surface of the plant. Other than that, they have motor cells for leaf rolling which allow leaf to roll up when short of water, decreasing surface area exposed to the air and trapping moisture inside the rolling leaf. And then they have a few sunken stomata. Stomata are protected and surrounded by moist air, reducing water vapor loss from the leaf surface. And then they have extensive finely branched root which is enable efficient water absorption from soil, even in a dry condition. And on top of that, they also have stomata closure and dormancy, which allow the plants to enter dormancy during prolonged drought, conserving water until condition input, and enabling the plant to survive without growth. Let's look into how rice adapt for growth 
in wet condition. They have about three features available which helps the plant to survive in wet condition. First, look at the tolerant to high ethanol levels, which allow cells to respire anaerobically, which is produce ethanol to survive in low oxygen environment when roots are submerged. And then they have aerosol in stem. Aerosol tissue create large air spaces, facilitating the diffusion of oxygen from the air down to the submerged root, which is aiding in survival. And then on top of that, they also have elongated stems for leaf exposure because some rice type grow elongated stems to keep leaf above water level, ensuring continuous access to the air for gas exchange during photosynthesis and respiration. So in conclusion, he crop plant stand as a testament to the intricate relationship between nature and humanity, which offering boundless opportunity for innovations and sustainable growth. So, thank you for your attention and may your curiosity continue to thrive. And please don't forget to subscribe to Jones Tamila YouTube channel.